So welcome everybody to Beanstalk a t University number 15. Uh, we're glad that everybody could make it. Uh, happy to have you here. So um, for those of you that are new, join us for the first time. This is essentially kind of a weekly AMA that we have. Um, I'm Rex. I'm the head of community here at Beanstalk. And uh, with me, as always, is Publius, uh, head of engineering and one of the, or, and the founders of Beanstalk. And really, this is just an opportunity for uh, folks from the community to come in and ask questions and kind of have some free-form conversation. We try to keep it around an hour, um, but we will go over if there's some really good discussion or some questions that are left to be answered. Um, I'm watching the class discussion. I haven't seen a lot of stuff come in yet. Um, if you have questions, either you can drop them in that class discussion, or if you want to raise your hand, we can actually bring you up on stage and more than happy to do that and let you ask your questions from up here. Actually, there is kind of a question from uh, Nimzer, and it's actually about events. And really, basically, the question was, hey, are, there, um, are there regular events that appear in the events section? And I'll take that one quick just to say yes. Um, so there are some kind of regular things that happen throughout the week uh, for Beanstalk. And the two that are most common right now, one is the one that you're list, the thing you're listening to right now. So we've got a and University. Uh, it's 7.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern Standard. Um, I'm not smart enough to do all the different time zones, but I know where I'm sitting right now at 7.30. Um, so that is essentially every Tuesday evening. And then every Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, we've got the Dow meeting. And really, that's uh, a little bit more action-oriented. Usually, um, the department heads come in and talk a little bit about what's going on in their department. Um, and it's also an opportunity for folks from the community to ask some more pointed questions about specific projects or, you know, kind of talk about, um, you know, more like update type things. Um, so those are the two regular events that we have every week. Um, we're also in the community group. We're talking about doing things like um, what we have kind of poorly named office hours. Um, and we're working out when we want to do that. Uh, but basically just creating an open space uh, on a regular time, at regular times during the week, probably a couple times during the week, um, where folks can just kind of come in and ask questions. Um, we realize that this setting with, you know, 26, 30 folks um, might not always be the most comfortable to ask questions about like, how do I use MetaMask? Or, you know, what is the difference between a bean and neither? Um, but we want to create a space where people can do that and have those questions. And we can have a lot of really good discussion about even some really basic topics. Um, we are working that out. As we work that out, that will go up in the events calendar as well. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, first question is from Dumpling, our head of operations. So, uh, Dumpling asks, can you describe the CRV CVX proposal, where it stands, and what to expect from it? So, not sure exactly what Dumpling means by CRV CVX proposal. There's the curve gauge proposal, which is currently live, and then there's separately, you know, we're working to develop the integration for yield bearing tokens into the silo that would facilitate that, for example, the deposit of convex bean three curve tokens in the silo once uh, the, the pool is added to the gauge. So to talk a little bit about the gauge proposal, we received some initial feedback, which was great and we responded to, and then some follow-up questions. And the, the center of the follow-up questions were around the audit and particularly given all the novel code in Beanstalk, you know, they were basically asking when is a public report going to be, a public audit going to be live, and when can we, and and what are we planning on waiting until, it, uh, they said a few, but at least one, I think, uh, public audit report is live. And so with that in mind, uh, and especially given that the silo upgrade to support convex bean three curve, for example, which would be the main use case of once uh, the the pool is added to the gauge, that's still a couple weeks away. There's no real reason in our 
opinion to push that proposal through. And so the the question then becomes, well, how quickly can we get a public report out there from Omnisha, who's you know done their initial report already, and we're in the process of finishing up some tweaks uh, to send to them that reflect their audit. And so, I mean, I would say at the short end, maybe within a week, we could expect the first public report from Omnisha. Uh, maybe two weeks is more realistic. Um, but but the thing to comment is Omnisha did audit a slightly older version of the code because we're constantly pushing so many bits. And so accordingly, the only thing that's a little tricky is the public report will ultimately be that they audited all of the code, but it's only some of, you know, there's some new code as well. And so the, the, that may still be a little bit uh, imperfect from a, like everything is audited perspective. But at that point in time, I think we'd probably be more comfortable charging ahead and trying to push through the curve gauge proposal, even if people are like, we want more audits. It's like, yeah, well, you know, within reason. So the that's kind of the current status on the curve gauge proposal. And then obviously the related convex uh, or other yield, uh, yield bearing token integration into the silo, uh, that's that's also underway. So all of all of this will hopefully be resolved uh not simultaneously but back to back to back over the next three to four weeks let's call it i appreciate that and i'll i'll follow up with a question that i think dumpling and i both have together could you just give a, a little bit of clarity on on what gauging is about how that process works and just give the give the room a little bit of sense of how that works and and what the advantages are if you're holding specific tokens. Okay, so Curve is a pretty sophisticated ecosystem. And so we'll try to keep it somewhat simple, but here's the high level. So there are Curve emissions, uh, CRV token emissions, that are distributed to various liquidity pools. Now, those, uh, the specific, the specific distribution of those CRV rewards is de determined by the curve gauge. And so the gauge system refers to the distribution of CRV rewards to different curve pools. So what it means to be added to the gauge or to make a proposal for a pool to be added to the gauge simply means that people will be able to vote within the gauge system for your pool, for or for a given pool, um, to receive some of that gauge rewards. And so the other side of this thing to briefly mention is, well, how does curve voting work? So in order to vote, uh, you actually need to lock up your CRV tokens, uh, at which point they become VE CRV, vote escrowed CRV. And VE CRV, the effectively the strength of the vote within the gauge is dependent on the time lock on the VE CRV. And so you can lock your VE curve uh, up to for, for up to four years. And the longer from when your VE curve unlocks, uh, the more voting power that you receive within the gauge system. And so the, that's the starting point. Now, the, the tricky part around Curve is that they have a whitelist such that not uh, most smart contracts cannot actually participate in the VE Curve system. And therefore, there, there are only a few uh, whitelisted smart contracts. Convex is among them. And therefore, what, what has happened in practice is because Convex is whitelisted on their uh, on, on the Curve platform for the Curve gauge, basically other smart contracts have to interact with the Curve gauge through Convex. And so that's where when people talk about the Curve wars or the sophistication around Curve gauge rewards, that's because most smart contracts can't actually interact directly with the gauge because of the VE Curve restriction. And therefore, uh, everyone has to participate via secondary protocols like Convex. And Convex 
has their own gauge system through which uh, the whole convex system then votes into curve. And so it's like a there's a market on convex uh, to, to figure out where uh, all of the VE curve that convex controls should vote to allocate curve gauge. And that ecosystem has layers and layers to it, which are probably not beneficial to get into at the moment. But that's, that's you know, the, the intro to how curve works, if you will. I appreciate that. And for anybody that's interested in learning a little bit more about this, so I, I, I myself was interested here, let's say a couple months, maybe say a month ago or so, um, Bankless actually has a really good episode on the curve wars and they talk through this process with some pretty significant detail in a way that I would say, I'm going to say people like me could understand, you know, people that aren't, you know, extreme DeFi natives. Um, so worth worth reaching out and uh, and tracking that podcast down. Very good explainer, and I appreciate that information, Publius. All right. So um, Austin just dropped the link to the podcast. How great is this community? I'm thinking, wow, hey. I wish someone would drop the link. It's boom, just like that. You know what? You know what we ought to do though. We should get our own podcast, Publius, and we can have these same discussions and just wax eloquent. You tell me time and place, Rex. <laughs> All right. Lots of good stuff. Uh, questions starting to come into the class discussion. Next question uh, is from the Pharaoh. And this is a this is a really good one. Um, it's one that we talk about a lot, uh, but it's always good to go back over. So uh, the Pharaoh's question is, um, there are currently a little over 600 million uh, pods in the pod line, correct? That would mean that the protocol is $600 million in debt having $42 million in supply. Wouldn't that debt to supply ratio indicate a dangerous situation? And Pharaoh's got a little bit more um, written. I'm gonna, Publius, I'm gonna let you take that first part of that question though, because I think there's a, a pretty good, pretty good component to talk through there. Sure. So your, your analysis is totally correct that Beanstalk has a lot of debt at the moment. And I think, in general, it would be totally disingenuous to say that excessively high debt levels are not uh, a dangerous situation. Ultimately, when you have a credit-based model, uh, the debt level is a key indicator of the health of the system. And so the fact that Beanstalk has an incredibly high debt level is an indicator that the system isn't in the most healthy state that it could be in. And so to answer you substantively, let's analyze both the actual level of danger uh, as we are able to based on market data, and then talk a little bit about what the future looks like and how Beanstalk may deleverage. So fundamentally, uh, Beanstalk's pod rate, uh, the debt level, has continued to rise over the past seven months since launch, but noticeably, or notably, I should probably say, notably, the pod rate has really started to uh, flattened significantly since around January 6th, uh, which uh, basically coincided to when BIP 9 went live. And so to give a little bit of context, uh, the last time Bean, Beanstalk went through a, a decent growth cycle, which was around the end of November, uh, Beanstalk had uh, what we would what we would certainly argue is uh, insufficiently uh, accurately set soil parameters, such that even during periods of time where Beanstalk was paying off lots of debt uh, and growing significantly, the amount of soil it had, the minimum soil parameter of Beanstalk was way too high. And uh, accordingly, and maybe just to give a little bit of context on why, why Beanstalk issues soil when the price is high and it's paying off debt. So, Beanstalk every season changes the weather based on the TWAP, uh, the price of a bean over the previous hour, the current pod rate, the debt level of the system, uh, and then also the change in demand for soil from season to season. And so in order to measure the change in demand for soil every season, Beanstalk needs to have some amount of soil outstanding such that it can measure demand for soil. And Originally, the minimum soil was set as a percentage of the total bean supply. 
And in short, uh, when Beanstalk was growing and there was a ton of debt being paid off, uh, there was also excess amount of soil available. And in short, uh, even though Beanstalk paid off 20 plus million dollars of debt uh, during during those two weeks or so while it was growing uh, late November, early December, it actually ended that period of growth in an objectively worse situation than it, it had been prior because the pod rate, the debt level of the system, the indicator of health was also higher than it was before it started. And so you had this huge wave of demand and then you ultimately had uh, it, the system was in a worse place than when it started, which is not what you want at all. And the result is that since then, the pod rate has continued to increase significantly. So uh, the thing to note is that between BIP6 and BIP9, uh, it is our belief that the soil parameters are set in a radically more efficient way at the moment. Uh, to be specific, in the case of when the price is above one, uh, Beanstalk uh, only issues the amount of soil at the start of each season such, such that basically if it paid off 10,000 pods at the start of the season, the most amount of pods it would be willing to issue during the season is 10,000. And so the, the pod line, the length of the pod line cannot increase uh, when the price is above one and for consecutive seasons. And there, even if there's excess demand for soil. And in, the, in those seasons, because the bean supply is increasing, uh, the supply is increasing and the amount of outstanding debt is staying constant, the pod rate will start to decrease. And so to answer a, a little bit about, well, is this a dangerous situation? Certainly it's dangerous because we'd much, we'd much prefer Beanstalk to have a much lower pod rate. But in the grand scheme of things, it's important to realize that under the new current parameters, whenever Beanstalk does go through its next growth cycle, uh, and when it did in November, uh, the bean supply went from 20 to 50. So it increased about 150%. But let's say the supply just doubles. Uh, if the supply doubles and the amount of debt outstanding stays constant, the pod rate should get cut in half. And if the pod rate gets cut in half, that will, even though it'll still have a very high debt level, like 800%, uh, it will be significantly lower than the current debt level. And that will be the, be the very beginning of a larger deleveraging of the ecosystem. And so while it, it's not necessarily reasonable to expect that entire deleveraging to happen all at once, uh, it's certainly reasonable to expect that as uh, the bean supply continues to expand, uh, at some point that deleveraging will, will occur. The other thing that I would draw um, a little bit of attention to, and this is both for the Pharaoh and for anybody else that's having, you know, these thoughts or, or questions about um, the the number of pods, really what Publius is describing, you can see if um, if you're on the bean.money site and you look under analytics, uh, you go into the, the field and then look at pods underneath that, you can see the curve of how, of how pods accumulate. And it's like the end of the first week in January, when we start to kind of flatten out and there's still an increase after that time period. It's like, you know, January 7th or 8th, um, that curve starts to, to really flatten out. The number of pods still increases, but it increases at a much more reasonable level. And I would say that that's much more in line with what, um, with what the protocol or what, what we want to see rather than as police was describing earlier, you know, you, you look a little bit further back in time, especially starting like, mid-November and you see those really steep increases in number of pods, you know, really the, the protocol health as of now, January 8th on is probably a little bit better of a, of a, of a gauge of what the current state is. Yeah. The, yeah. the only thing we would, we would just uh, comment is that there is a, a slight difference between pods and the pod rate. So pods are like the yeah. absolute amount of outstanding debt, whereas the pod rate is a function of the bean supply. Now, because the bean supply hasn't really changed over the past two months, uh, they look pretty similar. But I think the absolute amount of pods is less helpful as an indicator of the health of the system as as much as the pod rate is. Just that's a, that's yeah. a good distinction. I appreciate that. Yeah, Go to ahead. add on to that, so the, the pod rate, just to clarify, is the 
It's the ratio of Beanstalk's outstanding debt to the total supply. Uh, and I just wanted to say, like related to this question, I just added a chart to the Dune dashboard today. Um, it's in the uh, the field section, and it's called Bean Podline Clearance. So what it does is it shows you both the current market cap, um, and at each point in time for market cap, the market cap required to clear the pod line, um, and also the percentage increase required in market capitalization to clear the full pod line. So if you want some specific numbers and you want to see how these have evolved over time, you can check out that section of the dashboard to provide a little bit more color to, um, I guess, this topic. TB, you um, want to drop the link to the Dune dashboard in the class discussion. I see Austin. Yes. I see him. We <laughs> dropped a, um, a screenshot that Austin did too. Yeah, drop that link because actually while you were talking, I actually went to the Dune dashboard quick to look and see what you were talking about. It's really That's really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, it took me like five minutes to put together, so I don't know why it wasn't there before. But uh, there was some discussion going on in questions today, and that kind of inspired me to put that there. Um, but yeah, it, again, it is in the field section of the dashboard. It took you like five minutes because you're a wizard. I like. I yeah. mean, I've, I've also seen... I've also built a lot of basic data tables. So now when I have questions like these to answer, the tables are already built out. Um, if I was working with like raw data, then yeah, it would have definitely taken longer. But if you look at the query, like it's very short. That's awesome. You appreciate it. I also appreciate being called a wizard too. So thanks. Uh, for... Like straight up hat staff that shoots lightning. That's 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 what I'm seeing in my mind. It's Spike Spiegel, in fact, in the hat. Exactly. The wizard hat is cut out of the frame, but it's it's there on top of his head. All right. Okay. So um skimming down through... always down to stroke T Big's ego a little bit. Uh, you know what? It's it's time well spent. Thank you, Tebic. The analytics are A+. Plus. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, um, looking through, looking through. So, I guess... Also, just while we have 10 seconds, if people want to raise their hand, too, they can also just always hop up here if, if people want to ask a question as well. Completely agreed. And I'm, I'm looking through um, the rest of what the Pharaoh wrote, and I think... I think what you walk through, Publius, probably covered all of it, but I will throw that on on my lap, um, the Pharaoh. If if there's something that that you don't feel like was covered, drop it into the chat. I will be happy to to cover it more explicitly or go over it again or or, or re ask a question. Happy to do that. Well, well, I, I do see their question, and I think maybe just to answer the second part, which is slightly different, which is how will the protocol continue incentivizing creditors to supply beans and purchase debt as the waiting queue continues to grow, especially considering the current ratio would suggest that this, diff this difference will increase, not decrease. So the, the, the key thing to note is that the currently, and again, this could change at any moment for a variety of circumstances, but currently there does seem to be demand for soil. Uh, at roughly the current weather, such that Beanstalk can attract enough uh, lenders. And so while there's no reason to necessarily expect that to continue other than the track record that Beanstalk has continued to attract creditors, uh, in the case where Beanstalk can't attract creditors at a given weather, it will continue to raise the weather until it has found an interest rate that it can attract creditors. And so the way Beanstalk works fundamentally is if there's no one that's willing to lend to it, it can just continue to raise the weather until it finds someone that does. Now, it seems to be at a, a weather range roughly where there is sufficient demand for soil. Um, and, and I would argue, uh, given what we said earlier about the expectation that at some point the pod rate starts to decrease, uh, you know, that, that would probably be the thing where sustainability comes from. So, uh, you know, just want to make sure that we're doing our best to answer your questions. But again, as Rex said, if we didn't, feel free to type out whatever. Yeah, I, appreciate, up here. I appreciate you following up on that, Publius. 
that's a, that's definitely a good get. It's a team effort. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Um, actually, you know what? It's probably, I'll, I'll ask a question quick. I, I saw J-Dubs hop up and then hop down. I will, I will get you, I promise. Um, but since we're talking about things like weather rate, um, Publis, you want to talk just quickly about BIP13? Sure. So BIP13 seems to have uh, be doing pretty well. Uh, it's at almost a majority, I think. Yeah, 44%. Uh, it's got over three days left. And so that looks like so far it's going to continue to, um, like it looks like it's going to continue to accrue votes and pass, hopefully. Now, to speak substantively about it, we 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 spoke about it last class, uh, particularly uh, to to kind of introduce that this was likely going to get proposed. Uh, the the weather changes have been something that's been much discussed about, and it's actually a nice segue from the previous comment we were making to Pharaoh, which is well, Beanstalk will continue to raise the weather to find creditors, but th there's a problem at the moment which is uh, a result of the efficiency changes that were made to the soil in BIP 6 and BIP 9, uh, such that there's not enough soil available most seasons uh, for anyone to sow, uh, at most seasons particularly after the price was above one. So let's say 10,000 pods have harvested, uh, there may only be a little over 100 soil during that season or during the following season, excuse me. And uh, the the issue with that is when you consider ETH gas fees, you're going to pay $40 to lend 100 beans to Beanstalk. That's not necessarily cost effective. And so we have lots of seasons where there's basically no, effectively no soil uh, available. But if, there, if any time you have a season where there's significant soil, then there's demand for soil. And the problem is that uh, under the current system, Beanstalk views seasons where there's zero beans sown, even if there's only 40 soil available, it views that as decreasing demand. And so what these weather changes uh, or weather change, it's only a single weather change, uh, addresses is that in the particular case where the price is too high and uh, demand for soil is decreasing, uh, the only a weather change in, in that circumstance where the, the weather was raising or, or being increased at the moment uh, was when there's excessively high debt, which makes sense because Beanstalk tries to be as conservative as possible in the sense of it would much rather raise the weather too high to attract sufficient demand for soil than not attract enough demand for soil. So it would rather raise the weather uh, as opposed to not. It would rather be conservative and overpay slightly. Um, Maybe you could say that's aggressive, depending on how you want to slice it. But in either case, uh, Beanstalk basically went after a season where the price was above one, when you have 40 soil or 100 soil or less, uh, Beanstalk, no beans are being sown, and Beanstalk then is raising the weather. And so you have this weird edge case, which is getting hit constantly, where the price is above one, and then the next season, no matter what, the weather is going to get raised. And that's obviously suboptimal. So we are spending a lot of time and brain power trying to figure out a, 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 a long-term solution to measure demand for soil in a way that is accurate uh, and in line with the new soil parameters. But frankly, it's a non-trivial problem because how do you define that minimum below which it's not cost-effective to sell? Like that's an arbitrary thing to define. And furthermore, once you define it, everyone can game the system. And so 0.1 or 0 0.0001 less than whatever that threshold is to still have Beanstalk consider it decreasing demand. And accordingly, it's not so simple to figure out what's the best way to measure demand for soil in an accurate way. So given that it seems like it's going to be a little bit more time before we have a good solution here, uh, even though to date, we really haven't, uh, we, we've been strongly against I wouldn't say vehemently against, but strongly against, I almost said vehemently, strongly against uh, making any sort of short-term changes or fixes to the protocol. In this case, it, changing a one to a zero to address a very obvious uh, inefficiency in the current model seems like a reasonable step to take, uh, even as a short-term fix, given that at the moment, 
Beanstalk is attracting creditors in the current weather range, uh, is doing a decent job of maintaining peg stability, uh, even with ETH down below 2,600. And accordingly, you know, even though Beanstalk would rather be more conservative and pay slightly higher, that doesn't mean that it should raise the weather in this circumstance. And so this weather change adjusts that effect in practice will basically address that one circumstance. And until we have a more refined method to measure demand for soil and affect the weather changes, this seems like a good intermediate step. So that that's a little bit about BIP 13. And uh, for those of you that have not voted, you know, we would we would encourage you to go take a look at the BIP. Great information. Definitely appreciate it. Um, got a little feedback from uh, from Pharaoh. Says uh, loves the transparency. The whole system's complex, and the code is rather genius, Publius. Not bad. Um, and uh, is just uh, is is appreciative of the work that's been put in. So it sounds like we've gotten gotten those questions answered. Always happy to do so. Well, and, and, and particularly the thing that they highlighted was that the, the whole system has fully decentralized governance implemented across the whole protocol. We have to give all the credit there to Nick Mudge, who created 2535, which really the diamond standard is what facilitates a lot of this. So uh, we, we really do feel like we're just uh, one brick uh, in, in the in the group of people that are building uh, the decentralized future. So uh just just grateful for all this other cool tech that we can we can leverage and help build on top of all right next in the chat dumpling so uh dumpling says Publius and rex hop in the delorean with me and zoom forward one year i'm trying to think if the delorean had more than two seats it might have been a two seater when you got Mr. Fusion in the back. Anyway, I well, agree. Yeah, I think I think at the end of uh isn't at the end of Back to the Future One, Marty, Doc, and the girlfriend are in the car, or is it just Marty and Doc? Yeah. And I think all three of them. I think all three, yeah, yeah, because it gets crowded when he puts Mr. Fusion in. But yeah, during the first movie, I think all three of them fit. Anyway, geez, we're way off the way off the uh the trail here um, we don't so. claim not to be nerds here guys just for <laughs> for full disclosure that's not you, one of our claims we make you gotta you gotta own it um so if you saw the market cap on coin gecko at 3.8 billion beans or dollars worth of beans but you hadn't yet been to bean.money what would you expect the weather and debt level to be at so in other words fast forward one year we're at a $3.8 billion market cap on CoinGecko. What would you think when, when all this settles out, when we deleverage, when we move into what's considered or what we might consider kind of a normal operation uh, with the protocol humming, what would you expect the, what would you expect the weather at that level to look like? So frankly, it's almost impossible to give a good answer uh but i will try so let's say beanstalk grows to a four billion dollar supply that means that uh at likely and this is a maximum but it's likely that it will be close to this because of the amount of outstanding debt half of the new beans minted so 1.9 billion beans will go to paying off pods in this mm -hmm. scenario mm -hmm. so frankly it's hard to imagine that under the new parameters, if 1.9 billion pods have been paid off over the next year, that Beanstalk will have a very high debt level mm -hmm. um, as, a, as, a, as a function of like the, the pod rate. So the, the debt level is likely to be significantly lower. Uh, it's very hard to speak at, about the length of the pod line in that case, because again, the pod line doesn't necessarily ever get any shorter. If there's always demand for soil, the pod line should always stay the same length. It shouldn't necessarily get shorter. Hmm. And so the pod line may be a billion long, in which case you'd be at a 25% debt debt ratio. You could be at a 2 billion pod rate, uh, you know, or pod, you you could have 2 billion pods and a 50% pod rate. Um, that puts it at single digit percent. Um, so I think if we're at 3.8 billion beans, it's likely to be single digit percent. Now, 
let's say Beanstalk rose to 3.8 billion in the next two months. Again, not financial advice, just playing through a theoretical scenario. Yeah. And then it it grows further to 10 billion and then crashes to 3.8 billion. Well, that would be a radically different scenario, right? Where now Beanstalk needs to remove 7 billion beans from the supply. And then it could end up issuing $10 billion of debt, in which case, or, or $50 billion of debt, in which case the pod rate may go back up to a thousand, right? We could see a scenario where the pod rate goes as low as 10% and then back up to a thousand percent. So there's a lot of flexibility within uh, that, that, that scenario dumpling laid out around the pod rate. And that's why it's very, uh, that's why it's very difficult to, to, to estimate. Now, with regards to the weather, uh, that's even tougher to say because how the weather will change is basically a function of demand for soil. And so if we play out that there's long periods of time where there's extensive demand for soil, uh, it, it honestly depends on whether or not, what, like what the new measurement of demand for soil looks like. And therefore it's hard to predict how quickly the weather would decrease in those scenarios. but. Uh, you know, Beanstalk has been alive for seven months and the weather is basically 7,000%. So uh, if you assume when it's growing, uh, you know, it, it may take a couple of months of growth, consistent growth to decrease the weather to back to the low thousands or high hundreds. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know uh, whether the weather is going to be it come all the way down when Beanstalk deleverages to 10% or whether the fact that it decreases slowly enough that it may never get all the way back down. And then whenever, you know, there's too many variables to make a, a real prediction like this. But hopefully my rambling was instructive as to how it might be constructive to think about a problem like this. Fair enough. Sounds like there are a lot of variables involved. All right, so J Dubs, I had uh, you'd been up a minute ago and hop back down. You wanna you wanna hop back up and ask a question? There he is. Hey guys, actually, I was gonna ask a question uh, that Publius basically addressed before about credit based systems. So uh, that's why I popped off. He was actually answering it while I was gonna ask. So there you go. I think that's evidence we talk too much. <laughs> Got to cover all the bases. Got credit-based systems and a debate about the back seats in the DeLorean. All right. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat right now. Um, does anybody else want to hop up on stage? Jay Dubs, go ahead. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I'll ask a question. Actually, somebody uh, new to the um, new to the community popped a question in the other day, uh, which I thought was really good. That I actually embarrassingly didn't know the answer to. Um, so, please, can you talk a little bit more what happens with stock and seeds right now uh, when someone exits their silent position, uh, and yeah, what happens to the stock and seeds? Sure. So, when you say what happens, it's hard to say what happens because it's a little bit metaphysical in the sense that uh, your I mean, to get into the nitty gritty, Beanstalk stores a map of a silo member's deposits by token address, by season. And in short, when you withdraw from the silo, you're removing a deposit from that map. And so like in practice, to, to give you the technical answer before I give you the non-technical answer, nothing is really happening when you withdraw other than uh, an entry is being moved uh, from your list of deposits to your uh, list of withdrawals in practice. Uh, it's not technically a list, but um, that's that's what's happening at the contract level. Now, that's primarily a function of the fact that stock is not liquid. So there's no token that actually needs to get burnt at the moment. Stock is just uh, an accounting item that the user interface can display and calculate based on the current state of your deposits, for example, or the Dune Analytics uh, dashboard can do a similar thing. So to give you the non-technical answer, what's happening with your stock and your seeds? 
So when you deposit assets in the silo, you receive stock and you receive seeds based on the bean denominated value of the assets that you deposit. And the stock entitles you to bean seniorage, new beans that are minted. The seeds entitle you to new stock over time. So neither, neither stock nor seeds are currently liquid. The expectation is that stock will become liquid in the not too distant future, whereas seeds are less likely to become, uh, uh, the seeds are less likely to become liquid. And so in short, when you, when you, when you withdraw from the silo, you are, you have to take all of the stock, all of the seeds, and all of the stock from the seeds that you accrued for your given deposit, because stock grows from seeds over time. Uh, the longer you're deposited in the silo, you have to forfeit all of the stock and all of the seeds associated with it. Uh, and so, uh, in short, uh, that's you know that's what's happening uh, in a practical level. You're you're electing to burn all of your stock, all of your seeds, and all of the stock that has grown from your seeds uh, in, in order to withdraw your assets from the silo. Great, thank you. So I wanna riff on that for just a second to kind of go back to something we were talking about earlier. Um, so we were talking about things like curve gauges, and convex tokens, um, there was someone that put out a YouTube video just today, dumpling references that I can't remember the name of the individual. Man, it's I'm kicking myself. I should know it. Anyway, so um, the the um, premise of this YouTube video, or at least part of it, uh, talked about how theoretically in the future someone may be able to to deposit convex tokens into the silo and certainly you can stop me if i'm getting off track here deposit convex tokens into the silo um be able to realize the emissions associated with those convex tokens and stock and seed benefits as well is that is that correct am i on the right path so, so the short answer is yes. One of the next upgrades to the silo that Beanstalk Farms will hopefully propose in the not too distant future will facilitate earning interest, not just from Beanstalk, but also from other protocols. So currently, if you deposit an asset in the silo uh, and that asset has some sort of yield bearing asset uh, uh, aspect to it, in practice, because the assets are owned by the silo on the Ethereum blockchain, they're, they're currently uh, in, in the smart contract, the, the Beanstalk contract itself will be the, the thing that accrues the rewards. And the thing that Beanstalk needs to be upgraded to support is the accounting of those rewards to efficiently distribute them to the people that actually earn those rewards, if that makes sense. And so what the silo will be able to do in a general way is support earning rewards from multiple protocols simultaneously in addition to Beanstalk. So an example is, let's say there's a Frax bean pool on Curve, and there's Curve gauge and FXS gauge rewards being distributed to this LP pool or LP tokens. Uh, you, you would be able to deposit those LP tokens in the silo, continue to earn, uh, continue to earn your FXS rewards, uh, if you're doing it via convex, you'd actually be depositing convex bean fracks into the silo. You would then also receive boosted CRV rewards uh, via convex. And so the idea is that uh, that's just one example, but you can see how you can start to receive multiple yield generating revenue streams, or I guess just a revenue stream uh, from different protocols all within the silo. Yeah, and so what, what it seems like is happening over time is as people become more imaginative with how they want to kind of layer those benefits, that will lead to greater incentive to put wider varieties of more complex assets into the silo that in turn 
bolsters the silo itself, creates stability within the, within the protocol, and then multiplies the advantages of whatever those tokens are by including those stock and seed benefits, right? So totally right. And to expand on that a little bit more, the product market fit for beans within the, like where, where can you use beans? Well, you can deposit them in the silo and that's cool. But the product market fit for bean stock and for beans within DeFi at large comes from the generalized silo. And the fact that you, like, what do you actually want to trade against? If you're cryptocurrency A, right? You want to trade against something that is stable and has really low borrowing costs. Because if you're trading against USDC and USDC has 10% borrowing costs, well, guess what, buddy? You're paying for that. Like you are paying that implicitly because you're trading against a coin with a negative 10% carrying cost. And so anyone that's providing LP has to get compensated in some way for the fact a negative 10% yielding stable coin to provide liquidity. That stinks. So beans have the opposite situation. They're positive yielding. You can leave your beans in the silo, convert them to liquidity against other tokens, earn a higher rate of beanstalk native reward. And, and that is where product market fit ultimately comes from. And so you have all these beans in the silo that are looking for, to provide liquidity, are looking to start trading against other tokens. And so that's where this generalized silo starts to get really exciting is you're going to have all of these other tokens that at some point realize they want to be trading against beans. And the way to get trading against beans and trading against a lot of beans, if you have a lot of liquidity, is you need your pool to be added to the beanstalk uh, silo. It needs to be whitelisted in the silo. And so that's why defining a process for uh, beyond just a BIP, right? BIPs are pretty intensive. So that's why it's interesting to move to more of a gauge system that allows uh, people and, and uh, groups to propose adding different uh, assets uh, to, to the whitelist uh, in a much more modular fashion than requiring necessarily a 50% vote in favor. So uh, still thinking exactly about how they work, but uh, you can see how making that as modular and flexible as possible to benefit Beanstalk. Completely agreed. Oh, and before I forget, so Dumpling dropped the right information in. Cesar Snack Sandwich is the uh, the gentleman that that uh, just put out that um, that YouTube video about the curve gauge explainer, and he also dropped the link in the class discussion. So anybody that's interested can follow that link and watch the video. It was, it was good. I thought it was pretty informative. I learned a little bit myself. So um, anybody else uh, have any questions? I have one more if no one else does. I want to invite anybody that's interested first, though. Whoa, Dumpling, is there There's an emoji or a reaction emoji in, in Discord that is a Dumpling? That's fantastic. Yeah, we're going to start trolling you with that, Dumpling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No matter what you say, you're only going to get a dumpling. <laughs> it's completely uh, sentiment neutral. You know, exactly. Like... It's just an act. act. Yeah. We've seen your message. Yeah. Or or the word okay. Oh, that's great. Um. So I will. Uh, I will. I'll throw this question over to you, Publius, and um, we'll leave it open for for more folks. We still have a few minutes. Um, but so I guess it was last week, um, we had a Twitter space with Fiat Dow. Um, you want to talk for just a minute about, about what that project is and what they're looking to do and, and how that relates to the pod marketplace and want to run through that. Sure. So Fiat Dow is super cool. They are a protocol that is facilitating, uh, the hedging of and borrowing against uh, zero coupon bonds, which are a bond uh, that doesn't have any yield associated. And pods fit into that category because once you get your pods, the pods don't uh, earn any additional yield. It's only earned at the time you lend to Beanstalk. And pods 
don't have a fixed maturity, which does add some level of complexity to the integration with Fiat DAO because their original version only supports zero coupon bonds with a fixed maturity date. But in short, we were able to work through with them how a system might work where uh, you would be able to borrow against your pods and effectively mint fiat token, uh, which is the, the fiat DAO uh, stable coin, which isn't tightly pegged. It's loosely pegged to a dollar, which is, I mean, you guys know us. We're big fans of loosely pegged uh, as opposed to making an explicit peg. So I think that model is pretty cool too. And the idea is that you're effectively, it, it, once we are able to come up with uh, a reasonable proposal for them on how to value pods effectively, um, which which uh, TBIC uh, is working on uh, an, an analysis of some of the data from the pod marketplace uh, to, to provide some of those uh, data points to them. Uh, once they kind of green light our proposed valuation methodology for pods, uh, it seems like it's kind of all systems go for things to move forward such that in the not too distant future, people will be able to actually borrow against their pods. So I want to take that idea and kind of layer it in with some of the, uh, the chatter that I've been watching on Twitter over the last couple of days. So We've got this this concept that you just walked through, Publius, about what Fiat DAO is trying to do. And at the same time, I've been watching Omis on Twitter starting to blow up about leveraging the pod marketplace for arbitrage opportunity. And I feel like there's almost like these those these those two concepts fit together potentially very very well, especially if you've got if you got the beans to, to get levered on fiat DAO bonds and use that for arbitrage, I mean, you could, there's, there's some potential to really make some, some real good moves if you're, if you're able to watch and, and kind of utilize and, and take advantage of some of those inefficiencies. And um, yeah, it seems like those, those, those ideas of arbitraging in the pod marketplace and the fiat DAO's zero coupon bonds could work together really well. Well, this is the thing that's so exciting to see, right? Ultimately, Beanstalk is designed in a way where independent market participants who are all acting in their own self-interest ultimately contribute to the success of the project. Like, that's, that's the goal. And it's really cool to see in practice something that was created by the community, like the farmer's market, serving such a pivotal role in the the it, having different participants get involved in their own independent exposure to beanstalk that ultimately contributes to peg maintenance and that's really cool could not agree more it's funny um you know, i feel like when we use the term arbitrage in in trad fire traditional finance it usually has a negative connotation you know it's that swashbuckler you know profit taker um you know i, I admittedly I, you know, I live in the world of commodities so i think of you know the 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 commodity trader that's making deals that would make your stomach turn but here in situations like this you just said it i mean it's a real way to facilitate peg maintenance and really build a more robust system in the process this is uh the beginning of the debt market starting to become, you know, ultimately it's still not there yet, but uh, in the, in the not too distant future, uh, day by day, it's going to, at some point it's, it, we're going to blink and it's going to be like, Whoa, when did this, when did this actually start to form a real curve? You know, when, wh when did that happen? Uh, yeah. When did, when did that order book actually fill in? So uh, it's starting to happen. Yep. Indeed. All right. We got, Three minutes left. We have enough time for one more question from the crowd. One more question in the chat if someone feels so interested. Anything um, before we let everybody go? And if not, you know, we would just use this opportunity to pull Beethoven up here and maybe uh, 
Oh, yes. Hit us with a jig. Oh, yes. He's in the crowd. No, pr no pressure, Beethoven. No pressure whatsoever. He's got his hand raised. I'm, I'm, I'm a noob here. I'm going to try to see. I'm with you, Austin. That also sounds like pressure to me as well. Uh, Beanto, yeah, there we go. Come on up. There he is. Tuning his guitar, no doubt. We'll, we'll, we'll give them. Oh, he's ready. The maestro ready. is ready. <laughs> Oh, maybe not yet. He hit us with the head. What's up, Dean Tobin? See, we gotta we have to be more purposeful for Bean Tobin. We gotta like we gotta warn him. Cause I think he's I don't know. I feel like I feel like I don't know. This is uh <laughs> you know, this is I, I, I just assume Beethoven like walked a guitar on his back. That's, that, that's exactly what was going through my mind. Like he's like rushing around a room, like throwing guitar cases open, grabbing whatever he can. He's like got a harmonica somewhere that's like totally. the only thing in arm's reach. Yeah, we, we I think we scared them off officially. <laughs> We've offended Beethoven. Apologies, Beethoven. Oh man, so much fun. Good times. All right. Well, so I think what we will do is, um, I think we'll go. Oh. He's back. Come on, Bean Tobin, lay it on us. You can turn on. Anticipation builds. This is like <laughs> a good concert. Everyone's waiting. When's the artist going to come? That's right. We're just the opening act, Publius. People are here to see Mean Tobin. I sure hope so. I hope y'all aren't here to hear us. <laughs> oh, I can see it. Okay, so Bean Tobin says, sorry y'all, Discord hates me, but not as much as I love you all. That's very kind of you. We can, we Fair can, we, yeah, we can, we can, we, hey, no pressure, no pressure. It's it's no all pressure. good. We understand. Don't pull your hair out, Bean Tobin. That's right. Lift it right another day. <laughs> All right, we will call it a night. Um, as always, always appreciate everyone's time, all the good questions, all the good conversation. Um, we will plan to meet back here in a week. Um, like I said earlier on, we're, we'll have the Dow meeting coming up on Thursday night as well at 8.30 Eastern. And um, as always, I think you can find us in Discord chat and on Twitter. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for your time. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone.